Good morning, everybody. Hopefully everyone's doing well. Uh, if you can give me a green check, we'll get started once everyone chimes in. Uh, we're gonna start unit six today. Uh, there's only six, seven, and eight left. Crazy. I know you guys are talking about in chat how fast November went, and it's kind of weird uh, the first semester because you have the winter break and then you're done. Like you only have a couple of weeks in January to kind of finish things up. So uh, you think November went by fast. December, there's only three weeks of class, and then January, we only have, you know, two weeks of an exam. So uh, it's going to fly by from here on. Uh, I'd like to go through Unit 6 Lesson 1 first, and then if you had anything uh, from Lesson, or Unit 5, I should say, that you kind of unsure of before you submit that learning guide or go through that test, I, I could find some time to do that. Um, so let's jump right into lessons, uh, Lesson 1, Unit 6. Looks like everybody's ready to go. The funny thing about Unit 6 is that uh, some of the things we talk about in Unit 5, we talk about again in Unit 6, things like slope of a line, but we look at it a lot more closely. So it's kind of weird how the units kind of pop up. Sometimes it makes more sense to do uh, Unit 6 first and then do Unit 5. That's why I kind of mixed up the units, but we'll just kind of stick with it and uh, go from here. So. The first thing we're gonna do in lesson one is just talk about the slope of a line. And we've talked about the rate of change so far in uh, lesson, or unit five, which is the exact same thing as the slope. So rate of change, slope, rise over run, these are all sort of uh, synonyms for one another, they're all the same word, just talking about the same thing. So we should define slope here as a measure of how one quantity changes with respect to another. And sort of one word that comes up a lot with slope is change. We talk about the change in the x-axis, the change in the y-axis, um, how one quantity is changing with respect to another. And change, uh, we'll look at it, it just means you start somewhere, you end somewhere. What was the change? What happened between your start and your end? So let's kind of look at what slope can equal. So slope is equal to the easiest way to think of it is rise over run. That's just what slope is. Another way we can define slope is a change in y. Remember we talked about the Greek letter delta or the triangle being a change. So let's go back here. The triangle means change. So we have a change in y over a change in x. Now if you think about it, y is the vertical axis, so that is the rise, and then x is a horizontal axis, which is the run. So rise over run, change in your vertical over the change in the horizontal. Uh, and then from the last unit, we talked about slope also equaling the rate of change. So from unit five, uh, slope, rate of change. So these are all different ways we can represent the slope and just depends on sort of what the circumstances are. Um, and we'll pick one of the sort of three different ways. It's, it's not important that you remember the ways, it's just when you're going through a question, maybe it's like a word problem, and it asks for the slope, it's probably talking about the rate of change. If you're looking at a graph, and it has lots of little grid points on it, rise over run will work, and then change in x over change in y, we'll actually get into that a little bit further on uh, when we start actually calculating values for the slope from lines. So there's a little picture here. 
Now, when we say change or rise and run, change in X, change in Y, so rise is the change in Y, run is the change in X, what we mean is, just like when you read a book, you start at the left side of the page and you work your way across to the right. So when we talk about change in math or looking at these graphs, you're always going to read a graph from the left side, left side, left side, to the right side, um, going from left to right. So the idea here is that if I started at a point, like this guy right here, and I said, okay, there's my start. I'm starting at the left. And then I go to the right, which is my end. And I have two points. I have this point here and this point here. And I want to know the slope between those points. So if I'm going, okay, how much do I need to rise? So I'm going up, 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 up. Okay, there we go. There's my rise and then my run. So going from left to right. So those are the kinds of things that you're going to get used to doing. And it only works if you go from left to right. A couple other things we should include. We've actually talked about these a little bit. Uh, if I have something, if I'm going from left to right, and it's going up to the right, this is a positive slope. If I have something that is going down and to the right, this is a negative slope. And we talked a little bit about that sort of idea when we were dealing with rate of change. We had things like uh, filling a tank up, um, kind of went you know, up, and then emptying a tank went down, reading from left to right. So these are just things that as you go over them again and again and again, uh, they'll just become second nature, but right now it's kind of the first time you've seen them. One other thing I should mention, um, if we have something like uh, that has a negative slope, you rise over run doesn't necessarily make sense. So for negative slope, think about uh, fall over the run. Because instead of going up, you're not going up. There's, you're just, you got to go down and then over. So when we're dealing with a negative slope, if it makes more sense reading from uh, left to right to go fall over run, then you can go ahead and do that if that uh, helps you kind of work it all out in your brain. All right, so there's some little graphs here and we're gonna figure out the slope of each of these lines, so four examples here. And they are basically the only four like the slope, the actual value for slope will change, but these are the only sort of four things you can have. You can have the first one is a positive slope, the second one's a negative slope, and then the last two, we're gonna look at these ones and try to figure out um, what those slopes represent. They're kind of the special cases. So there's only sort of you know four scenarios, positive slope, negative slope, a horizontal line, or a vertical line. Those are the only things you can have. I mean, the, the line can get steeper or shallower, the slope can increase or decrease, but you know, this is it. So the key to finding the slope is to find some points on the line. And what I mean by that is, uh, in order to find the slope, you need to have at least two points. And if you can find points that are on perfect intersections, on perfect grid lines, those are the ones you want to start with. So if we look at the first example here, I'm going to look really hard and see if I can find a couple points that are on a perfect grid line, uh, like an, a perfect grid intersection. So I can see one right here. That one's nice and easy to deal with because it's right on that y-axis as well. And it kind of looks like this point up at the top here goes through a perfect grid line. Now, one thing we'll talk about a little bit later is that the slope of a line is consistent. So any two points on the line, doesn't matter where you pick them, are always going to give you the same slope because the slope of the line doesn't change. So if you pick different points than I included here, that's completely fine. You're going to end up with the right answer. Um, so there's no right points to pick. Any two points on a line will always give you the right slope. Sometimes picking certain points will be easier, but that doesn't necessarily make um, you know different points more correct or incorrect. So the idea for slope 
And one thing I didn't define, but I will right now, uh, another way of representing slope is the letter M. And you're thinking, Mr. Borden, you've lost your mind. M, that doesn't make any sense. But the letter S for slope, um, the letter S could be like speed. Um, S is, S was already taken. So we have M and M is slope. I didn't come up with it, I'm sorry. Okay, so when we talk about slope, we start at our point on the left and go across to our point on the right and we read it from left to right and we start and we go rise over run. So if I start on the left and I say, okay, how far do I have to rise to get to my second point, which is on the right? So how far do I have to go up? So I go up, 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 up. So it looks like I'm going up one, two, three, four. So there's my rise. And then my run is going from left to right. How far do I have to go from here to get across to here? So it looks like I'm going over two units. So if I were to write my slope, I'd have m is equal to my rise, which was four, and my run, which was two. All right, so rise over run, four over two. Uh, four over two can be simplified a little bit because four divided by two is just two. So the slope of this line is equal to two. And you're thinking, to what? Well, um, it doesn't really have units slope. It is just, well, I shouldn't say that. Slope has units, but because our graph is just x and y, there's no units associated with it. So the slope is just two. And uh, we can compare it to other slopes in terms of value, a slope of two or a slope of like 10. Uh, it's just gonna be how steep the line is. So let's look at the next example here. And I'm gonna start at the same process. I'm gonna, I need two points. And I'm gonna try to find points that are perfectly on grid lines. So if I look, it looks like there's one here that's perfectly on a grid line. And then I could probably find another one, maybe this guy over here. It looks like there's a few more than that. You could probably uh, do this guy at the end as well if you wanted. It doesn't matter, any two will do. So again, we're gonna start at the left point, your left, which is my right, and go across uh, from left to right. And we're gonna see what the rise is and then we're gonna divide it by the run. You could maybe see the problem we're gonna run into here is that we are not going to be able to rise to get from our left point to our right point. So I start here. If I were to go up, it wouldn't make any sense. I'm not going to ever get to the second point over here. So I'm not going to rise. So that means this is a negative slope. So I should expect that my values um, should be negative. So instead of going rise over run, I'm gonna to have to go fall over run. Now, just always, I'll always say slope is rise over run, but if we have a negative slope, you're gonna to have to be able to recognize that. Even though it's fall over run, I'll always say rise over run. So we're gonna go down. We have to go from here down to there to get to where that second point is. So that looks like I went down three or negative three. And then my run is going from this point to this point. And that looks like a value of five because it's uh, going to the right, it's positive five. All right, so my slope is equal to my rise in this case is negative three because I went down three. And then my run is going to be positive five. 
Now I can't reduce that any further, so I can just leave it like that. And Abby's asking, should we just leave the negative on the top? Uh, yeah, we will always put the negative sign on the top. And I kind of alluded to that when we were dealing with fractions before. You can put it on top, you can put it out front, you can put it on the bottom, uh, all are correct. But for the case of slope, I like putting it on the top because that means it's always going to be uh, my rise is possibly going to be negative. It might be a fall if it's negative. Um, then my run is always going to be positive because I can always go from left to right. And uh, yeah, so there you go. Um, we're done with that guy. Let's go to the next one. This is a bit of a strange one, but these are kind of the special cases of slope. So I picked two points. Pick your poison. Any two points you want. Let's pick one here and one there. Those go through grid lines perfectly. I know slope, or the letter M, is going to be rise over run. Now if I go from left to right, how far do I have to go up to get from my left to my right point? I'm not talking about run, but I want to talk about rise. How far am I going up? It's a horizontal line. Do I have to go up at all to get across to my next point? No. So what value would I use to represent my rise? Zero. So my rise in this case is zero. My run is going across. In this case, my run is one, two, three, four, five, six. So my run is six. So I get 0 over 6. All right. Alex is citing me for a mathematics violation, saying it's illegal because you cannot divide 0. Funny thing in math, Alex, is um, you can go 0 divided by a number. You can put it in your calculator if you want, and your calculator will give you an answer. You cannot divide by zero. So you can't have zero in the denominator. You can have zero in the numerator. So if you have a calculator handy, you plug it in, you go zero divided by six, and you end up with just zero. So the slope of this line is zero, or you could say there's no slope. If that makes sense. So we can go 0 divided by a number, which is interesting because when I went rise over run, I could have picked any run I wanted. That line segment could continue on in both directions forever. And I could have a run of you know, 7 million if I wanted. And 0 divided by 7 million is still 0. So it doesn't matter what your run is. If you have a horizontal line, the slope is 0. Let's look at the second example here to kind of compare the two. Again, I'm trying to find slope. I'm going to go rise over run. So I'm going to pick two points, any two points. Uh, let's go this guy and that guy there. So if I do rise, I've gone up by one, two, three. So my rise is three. My run is going to be what? How far over? I guess I've been doing blue as my rise. How far over do I have to go? Uh, to get from one to the other. <laughs> Alex is a bit ahead of me here. Yes, this one is definitely illegal, breaking mathematical laws everywhere. My run is zero. So my slope is, now three divided by zero, in your calculator, it's going to give you an error. In math, we say this is undefined. Or you could say the slope is undefined. So this is kind of one of these tricky things with slope. If we have a vertical line, our slope is undefined. There is, uh, we can't define what that is because we can't divide by zero. But if we have a horizontal line, we say, oh, the slope of that line is zero because the rise was zero and the run was a number, so zero divided by a number is just zero. That's defined. But if we have a vertical line, it becomes undefined. So 
that is kind of the, you know, the four scenarios you're gonna run into. If you always go from left to right, you can have a positive slope, you can have a negative slope, you can have a horizontal line with zero slope, or you can have a vertical line with an undefined slope. That's it, those are the only four scenarios you're gonna run into. And one thing that's important is that when you are calculating your slopes, you should always reduce your values. So try to get your slope in the simplest uh, form you can. So like right here, four divided by two, we said, okay, four divided by two is two. We've reduced it as far as we could. Let's mosey on to the next example here. Alex has another thought-provoking question. Would you say the definition of powers is how many times you're gonna times one by that number, like five to the three is five times five times five. I'm confused as to why. Mm. I don't think that sort of as a definition works because, I mean, I guess it could. You can multiply by one if you wanted. I don't know, strange question. I don't know where that, that's coming from. Uh, so it's not like a fraction you don't simplify as a fraction. Uh, yeah, it is a fraction, Taylor. Um, and if you can simplify it as a fraction, you should. So if you have a fraction of four over two, simplify it. If you had something like eight over four, or if you had three over 12, you know you're gonna reduce three over 12 to one over four, it's a quarter. So whatever the fraction is, you're gonna just put it in simplest, uh, simplest terms. It makes your life easier. If you think about three over 12, trying to plot three over 12 as a slope on one of these graphs, you're gonna run out of points because it's just so big, but one over four, that's gonna fit. It's a little bit simpler, numbers are easier to deal with. All right, so we have uh, four examples here of slopes, and these examples are working backwards. So on question number one, we were given a line, asked to find the slope. So we went from left to right. Now we're given a slope and asked to draw the line. So let's start with RS here. RS has a slope of four over nine. Remember when we have a slope, we just have the rise over the run. So I can pick a point on my graph doesn't matter where it is. Somewhere on the left side will make my life a little bit easier. I'm gonna pick a, a point right here. You don't have to pick that point. You can put a point wherever you want. I'm going to always go from left to right. So I'm gonna move my way uh, across this chart going to the right. And I'm gonna use a rise of four. So I'm gonna go up one, two, three, four. So there's my rise of four and my run of nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm gonna put another point there. So I've gone to up four, I've gone across nine. We would typically call our first point R and our second point S. Uh, just like we read from left to right, we would identify our points going from left to right. Uh, left would be our first point, right would be the second. So I have two points. I'm going to break out my ruler. I'm going to attempt to connect these two points with a straight line. That was not a very good one, so I'll try again. That's about as good as I'm gonna get. So there we go. There is a line segment with a slope four over nine. I'm gonna do the same thing with my next one. Uh, let's maybe pick uh, red. So this is the rise and then the run. Now, before, I think it was Abby you asked, the negative sign, does it go on the top, the bottom, or right in front? And I said, you know, I always just put it on the top. So in this example, I have 
negative eight over three, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the negative sign on the top. And that's just gonna make it easier. I'm not gonna get confused with my negative sign um, because I've put it on the top and I will consistently put it on the top. So the negative sign now is always gonna be my rise. If that helps, I'm gonna pick a point. Maybe this guy way up here. And I'm gonna go from left to right. Now my, my rise is negative eight. So instead of going up eight, because it's negative eight, I'm gonna go down eight because it's negative. So here goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There we go. So we've gone down eight. And my run is three. One, two, three. So there's my second point. And we're calling this point T and this point U. And we will connect those two points. A straight line. There we go. There's T and U. Anything divided by zero should be infinity, because you can give nobody something infinity times, like I just gave nobody a cookie, and I can keep giving nobody a cookie infinity times, right? Uh, if it makes you feel good to give nobody something infinite amount of times, then uh, I guess that's okay. I don't know if it makes sense mathematically to calculate it that way. We can go with it if you want. You can give me no cookies, Alex. All right, AB, let's go with blue here, rise over run. But I don't have a run, so what do I do? I just have a four, I have a rise, no run. Does that mean it's a horizontal line? Does that mean I'm dividing by zero? What's going on there with just a four? What am I gonna do with that thing? Is it over zero, is my, is my run zero? Is my run something else? What do we think? Four, just a four. Hmm. Think about this for a second. If I had just a four and I went four divided by zero, can I divide by zero? No, that's undefined. So that doesn't make any sense. Uh, could I have four divided by one? What does that equal? Well, that just equals four. So Abby's uh, on the right track here. If I just have a four, that's the same thing as four divided by one. I can divide anything by one and I just end up with whatever it was. So let's pick a point over here, give us some room. My rise is gonna be four, so one, two, three, four. Go up to there, my run is gonna be one. So I'm gonna go across to there. So this is uh, A down here, we have B up here. There we go, a line segment connecting those things. A over B, rise and run. The last one's a similar sort of thing. I have negative one, this is gonna be rise over run, and my negative one is just gonna be the same thing as negative one divided by one. So I pick a point, my slope is negative one, so I go down one, and then I go to the right one. I have another point here. This is M, this is N. I connect those two points with a straight line. There we go. So that's a bit of a mess. All of the little, really fine lines I've drawn in here, you can just erase those if you want. You don't have to have those in there, which kind of confuses things. I mean, you're not always gonna be asked to draw a bunch of lines on one graph, but they don't necessarily have to be drawn. If you just have your lines, then that's fine.
Okay. Example number three, determine the slope of a line that passes through four negative five and eight six. So let's plot these two points on our graph and then we'll see if we can go rise over run to connect the two points. So four negative five. Uh, remember when we have these points, our first is our x, our second is our y. So the x is positive four and then I go down five. So one, two, three, four, down one, two, three, four, five. So that's point E. And then I have point F is going to be eight and six. So eight is my X, six is my Y. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, it's not going to fit. All right, so we're going to have to relabel our graph here. Sorry if you had gone ahead. Uh, we'll go up by twos. So we'll go two, four, six, eight, ten. Positive two, four, six, eight, ten. Negative two, negative four, negative six, negative eight, negative ten. Now everything will fit on there. Let's try this again. Uh, four, negative five is our first point. Be right there. So that's point E. And then F is eight, six. A uh, really good question. For all the questions, do we draw the line extending past the points, or do we just connect those two points? Generally speaking, unless it says line segment, you're gonna draw right through the points and continue on for the whole width of your chart. If the line were to specify a line segment from point E to F, then you would just connect the dots. So draw the line uh, going from one side to the other all the way, unless it says otherwise. In this case, it just says determine the slope of a line. It doesn't say line segment. So if we have a line, a line is going to continue on in both directions forever to infinity and beyond. All right, so I have 4, negative 5, and I have 8, Six. All right, so I have two points here. I'm going to connect them with a line because it says a line goes through these two points. Ooh, that was a good line. Look at that, right through those. Good for me. All right, now I need to figure out the slope. So it's asking me for the rise and then it's asking me for the run. Um, from E to F, what's the rise? So E is on the left, F is on the right, we're gonna go from left to right. Let's see what we can do here. If I go from E, I'm gonna go up, uh, what am I gonna go up? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 11. Remember each square represents two. So my rise is going to be this little green line I'll put in here. I've gone up by 11 units. So my rise is 11. My run is going across, and each square represents two. So I'm going over two squares, which is going to be uh, four. So it gets a little bit confusing because the graph we've drawn here, uh, each square isn't representing one unit. It's representing two. So if we have a rise of 11, a run of four, we're going from left to right, we went up and then to the right, so it's positive slope, uh, we end up with 11 over four. And I can't simplify that any further, so that's just my slope, 11 over four. And I'm, I'm just done.
All right, so there's a, a formula we can use that'll work for any line if you have uh, coordinates x and y. And that's this, um, that is indicated down at the bottom here. So if a line passes through any point A and B, could be any points, and A is a, an ordered pair x, y, and B is an ordered pair x, y, because all points on a graph can be written as an ordered pair. If you take the y terms and you go y2 minus y1 and x2 minus x1, you end up with the slope. And you're thinking, Mr. Board, and those twos and ones are on the bottom. Shouldn't they be on the top? This is so confusing. I don't know what's going on. Why are you doing this to me? Well, think of it this way. A is the first point. So everything in A has these little ones next to it. And then B is my second point, so everything here has little twos next to it. So these are called subscripts, and they just kind of help us sort out more than one point. Because if you think about it, if I gave you two points, I said, okay, you have a point like two, three, and six, seven. You're, I said, okay, take the x point, the x coordinate of the point, and then you'd say, well, there's two of them, which one? I'd say, okay, well, how can we kind of distinguish between these two points? We'll call everything here. This is my, gonna be my first point. So I'd have x1, y1, and everything here is my second point. So I'd have x2 and y2. So it's just kind of a way that we try not to confuse each other when we're talking about ordered pairs. If I had a third point, I could, you know, put in a third point, and it could be, I don't know, seven minus five, and this would be x3 and y3. So I could just keep doing that for as long as I want. The threes don't go on the top. It's not, it's not x cubed or y cubed or x squared or y squared. It's just x with a little three next to it to indicate it's the third point. Generally for slopes of lines, we only have two points. That's all you need to find the slope. So hopefully that kind of clarifies that. I know it can be a bit of a strange sort of thing. So what are we doing here? Well, we're taking the second y minus the first, and then we're taking the second x minus the first uh, to get the change. So we could also write this as change in y over change in x, where change in y is the second y point minus the first, and change in x is the second x point minus the first. We can just divide those things. That gives us the slope. Might not make sense right now. Let's look at an example of it. Example four, interpreting the slope of a line. Yvonne recorded the distance she had traveled in certain times. She began cycling trip across Trans-Canada Trail in Manitoba from Winnipeg to Grand Beach. She plotted the data on a point, uh, plot. What is the slope of the line through these points? What does the slope represent? All right, so let's use this new fancy formula we just wrote down. Let's pick two points. And I'm going to maybe do this a little bit backwards. I'm going to call this point down here B. And let's call this point up here A. Why B and A? Well, they're just random letters. But maybe it might be a little bit easier here in a second to think of it this way. So we're going to take the slope. And we said the slope. In this case, we're going to find the slope of uh, the line segment AB, or the, the slope of the line that goes through A and B. Now, we just said the slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Hmm. All right, so what's the ordered pair up at A, and what's the ordered pair down at B? So A is going to be x value first, which is 3, and then my y value is going to be 
72. And down here, for B, I have 1 for my x value and 24. for my y value. I'm calling this point up here A. This is my first point. Call it x1 and y1. And then same thing down here with B. I have x2, y2. Now you could have called my point A your point B and my point B your point A and you would have ended up at the same spot. So it doesn't matter which points you picked. You could have picked the middle point if you wanted. You could have called it letter uh, Q if you like. The A and B are just completely arbitrary. It doesn't matter. And then the fact that I chose A to be on the far right and then B on the left, that was an arbitrary, well, it wasn't an arbitrary decision. It was a decision that I made to kind of simplify things, but it, uh, it, was just, uh, it doesn't affect the outcome of the problem. All right. So I have two points. Maybe I'll rewrite them over here. I have my first point is x1, y1, and in this case it is 3, 72. My second point is going to be x2, y2. Get a little comma in there. Now I'm getting myself confused. And my second point in this example was 1, 24. So it's kind of like a substitution type thing here. We're going to take y2, which was what? Well, I said y2 was 24. So I'm going to put a 24 in for y2. Okay, y1. What is y1? Here's y1 over here. So I'm going to subtract 72. Okay, x2 is 1 from down here. And then I'm going to subtract x1, which was 3. Okay. Now I just do the math. 24 minus 72. It's going to give me negative 48, one, divided, or 1 minus 3, negative 2. 48 divided by 2 is going to be 24, and they're both negative. So the slope of my line is 24. All right, 24. There we go. So part B is asking, what does the slope represent? We have 24. Normally on a graph, we just have x's and y's, and we just say the slope's 24. But this example, we don't have x's and y's. Our vertical axis is measuring distance, and our horizontal axis is measuring time uh, in hours. So the values of y, the vertical axis, are measuring distance. And then the units here are kilometers. And then my x-axis is measuring time in hours. So if I took my, my x and my y and said, okay, rise over run or y over x, I'm going to end up with units of kilometers, because that's my rise, divided by hours, or kilometers per hour. So what does the slope mean? So the slope we found was 24 kilometers per hour. What does that kind of sound like? If I was driving to work and I was going 24 kilometers per hour, you'd say, oh, well, that's just how fast you were going. So what we've just calculated is how fast Yvonne was riding her bicycle. 
in the first, you know, three hours, essentially, she was riding 24 kilometers per hour. All right. So how can we answer part B? Uh, now, if I told you she was traveling at 24 kilometers every hour, how could we use that to kind of determine how far she went in one and three quarter hours? So the idea here is in one hour, we know she travels every, uh, every hour about 24 kilometers per hour. So in one hour, she's traveled about 24 kilometers. One and three quarter hours, how far has she gone? So one and three quarters, we can write as 1.75, because 75 is, or 0.75 is three quarters. So every hour, she's traveling 24 kilometers per hour. So if I took that 1.75 and multiplied it by 24, I would figure out how far she traveled in one and three quarter hours. So the speed at which she's traveling multiplied the time at which she's traveling, it is gonna give you how far she went. So 1.75 times 24 is gonna give us 42 kilometers. We can do kind of the backward sort of calculation. If I said, hey, She's traveled 55 kilometers. How long did it take her? Could we do that? Could we work backwards? So we know she travels about 24 kilometers in one hour or 60 minutes. So if she took 60 minutes to travel 24 kilometers, traveling 24 kilometers in one hour. We're trying to find a time, how long it takes to travel 55 kilometers. So if we had 60 minutes to take 24 kilometers, uh, 60 divided by 24 is gonna give us about 2.5 minutes to travel one kilometer. So continuing that kind of train of thought, 24 kilometers per one hour. If you kind of flip it and say, okay, 24 kilometers in one hour, 60 minutes to travel 24 kilometers, that's two and a half kilometers, uh, sorry, two and a half minutes per kilometer. And then I say, hey, she went 55 kilometers, how long did it take? You just say, okay, well, I could take my 55 kilometers and I could multiply it by the fact that it takes 2.5 minutes to travel a kilometer and then end up with 137.5 minutes. Hmm. Maybe we should divide that by 60 to figure out how many hours it is. Uh, so 120 minutes is going to give us two hours. So this is two hours and 17.5 minutes. All right, so part C, uh, something that you won't, at least for the beginning, you won't, have to do a bunch of these kind of word problems. So if you're, you're doing good up to this last little bit, then you're gonna be fine. Um, part C was just kind of taking the slope of the line and just going from there. You found the slope, 24 kilometers per hour. Can you do anything with that? Can you figure out how far she would travel in an hour and three quarters or how long it would take to travel 55 kilometers? So just using that 24 kilometers per hour. That's kind of it for the lesson for today. It's, uh, you know, the first one. Anybody have any questions? Anything I didn't cover? Anything that's maybe unclear? A couple questions coming in. Anything from unit five you wanted to go over? We have a couple minutes left before we're done. 
So yeah, like I don't want to confuse you guys with this last little bit. So if you were doing okay finding the slope rise over run using that slope formula, uh, that's good. The definition's at the beginning, sure. So slope was a measure of how one quantity changes with respect to another. That sort of word definition come up very often. If you can remember slope is rise over run, you're doing okay. In fact, I think slope is rise over run and the other formula we used, uh, slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, I think that's on your formula sheet. If you look carefully, So those were the kind of definitions. Then we have the formula, the bottom of the second page. This formula is on your formula sheet because it is a formula. Uh, it'll look like, I think it just looks like m y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, just like that on your formula sheet. So you don't have to memorize that. That's given to you. You'll use it so many times it'll just be one of these things that you just kind of remember. All right, I will go over the learning guide and then Alex, I can go back and look at some function notation stuff. Learning guide to print and complete. All right, uh, slope is what we've done today. So the first little bit is just using the sort of the definitions rise over run. And then you get to number six and it asks you to use the formula. So do your best there. Uh, seven is using a graph to determine the slope, and then eight is drawing the lines on the graph. So we've done stuff like that. So everything up to everything up to the end of page two. So two pages. Uh, question number nine is things that we're going to cover next day. So everything up to the end of page. two to this graph. Hopefully that makes sense. And Alex wants some function notation stuff. I assume that's what you meant by the that. Uh, could you go over the notation from unit five? I have a little bit of empty space down here at the bottom, so I'll just do it right here. Let's make up a a function. Let's go f of x is equal to x squared minus 5. So just a, a random question. All right, so maybe the question says, uh, what is f of 3? So what's f of 3? Figure that out. And you're like, okay, well, the x was an x here, but now the x has been replaced by a 3. So what I'm going to do is take all of my x's in this, and I'm going to replace them with 3's. So 3 squared is 9 minus 5. I end up with 4. All right, so that's that. What if I said um, f of x is equal to 11? And I said, you know, what is, what is x equal? What does x equal? That makes more sense. What does x equal? So what we're saying here is that this function f of x is equal to x squared minus 5. Now I'm saying, OK, everywhere there's an f of x, replace it with 11. So 11 is x squared minus 5. So you say, OK, I can solve for x. I'll add 5 to both sides. And I get uh, 16 is equal to x squared. 
I want to get x by itself, so I take the square root of both sides and I end up with 4 is equal to x. So those are the only sort of two types of questions you'll encounter. You're either going to have to put the x into the equation and solve for f of x, or we could, you can think of it as y if you like. Or I can say, hey, this whole thing equals 11. What does x equal when everything equals 11? The other sort of thing that can happen is you can end up with a, a graph. Now this is going to be hard for me to just throw off the top of my head here. But you could have a line that looks like that. And maybe this is x is equal to 2, and this is negative 2, and this is um, 2 up here, and then you have like 4. And I could say, all right, what is f of 2? And you say, okay, well, x is 2. Remember, the, this is normally where there's an x. So x is 2. Okay, where is x 2? So you look at the graph, the line, you say, okay, x is 2 right here. What's the value of y right there? Well, y equals 0. So f of 2 is equal to 0. Or I could do something like, you have a point up here. And we could say uh, f of x is equal to 2. And you'd say, okay, if f of x, or if you want to think about y is equal to 2, what does x equal? Well, if I find it, I go across, say, okay, y is 2, go across to my point, go down, and I say, oh, that's, you know, 4. So f of x is equal to 2, x is equal to 4. These are kind of the backwards type things you can do with graphs. I know that wasn't the best example of using a graph for the function notation stuff, but um, hopefully that might clear up some questions. So f of x equals 11 doesn't matter what x is, f will always be 11. Uh, yeah, because this is function notation, so I've, I give you one input if I say, you know, what did I use here? I said the input is 3, then you're saying, okay, the output is, so this is my input, the 3, and you're saying the output is 4. You can only ever have one output for every given input. So if I say, you know, input is 3, you're always going to say 4. So that's a good way to think about it. Uh, will there be any questions on the Unit 5 exam about the names of the different ways of writing linear and nonlinear relationships? I don't think think so. I don't want to say no because I haven't gone through the whole test bank. There's literally hundreds of questions, but uh, I'm not sure I'm kind of understanding what you mean between the linear and non-linear uh, like relationships. When I'm thinking linear and non-linear, I'm thinking of something like uh, y is equal to you know 2x minus 5, and that would be something that would be maybe linear, and then we could have something that like y is 2x squared plus 7, that's nonlinear. I'm not sure I really understand, looks like you're typing. Maybe you just clarify that and maybe I can help you a little bit further. The name for 2x4, oh, the, for like domain and range. Huh. I don't think there'll be, I, again, I'm not sure if it's, it asks for like, th what I would think would be something like, um, you know, define the domain in interval notation or define the domain in set notation, and then there would be a bunch of answers in set notation or a bunch of answers, you know, using a number line. Um, I don't imagine, I could be wrong, like I said, there's literally hundreds of questions in there. there. I don't think they would do something like, you know, what's the domain in set notation and then give you like four answers, one in, you know, a linear form and one in a set form and one in a... Uh, the idea here is we're not testing the domain and range, um, your ability to like name the type of thing. If you can find the domain and range, that'd be good. So if you... That being said, if you run into a question like that that's specifically testing the different types 
and your ability to identify the different types, um, you can just flag it and uh, go from there. Uh, I don't have time to go through all of those again. Um, we had interval, uh, set, number line, uh, word, I think there was one more. The ones that you'll see the most are interval notation and the um, using the greater than and less than signs, I forget what they call that even. Um, so yeah, it's, it's in the lesson in the, in the course. So do your best to go back and just have a quick look at it. I don't think there's anything specifically asking about it. If there is, flag it and I can have a look at it um, from there. But that's it for me for now. Uh, hopefully you can submit the learning guide today from Unit 5, write the test today or tomorrow. That's my hope. And we're going to be moving on to Unit 6, Lesson 2, tomorrow. Have a good afternoon. We'll see you guys tomorrow.